However, the impression of the other stays in their minds, and later in the novel when they meet, they recall that night when they first saw each other. We see in Tess of the D'Urbervilles a writing theme that is also present in Hardy's other fiction. That theme being, love transforms both the lovers and their environment. It creates within the already humanized world of their community a new setting polarized by their love and made over into an expression of it. Here is an example from Tess of how love transformed the environment of the lovers. The aged and lightened brick gables breathe forth stay. The windows smiled, the door coaxed and beckoned, the creeper blushed confederacy. A personality within it so far reaching in her influence as to spread into and make bricks, mortar, and the whole overhanging of the sky throb with a burning sensibility. It describes the way Angel Clare's growing infatuation with Tess transforms the dairy house at Talbothay's and its surroundings until they seem to him permeated with her personality. Fate, according to Hardy, is beyond human control. He envisages life as a struggle between will and destiny. The plot of Tess turns on a succession of disastrous accidents which are attributed to fate. Fate plays a significant role as a thematic basis for many of Hardy's novels. His characters are constantly encountering crossroads which are symbolic of a point of opportunity and transition. Once things have been put into motion, they will play out. Hardy's characters are in the grips of an overwhelming fate. For example, it is said that by fate, Tess's father, John Durberfield, meets the parson who informs him of his family's aristocratic ancestors, the Durbervilles. Because Tess's father is excited to hear this news, he goes out drinking. Therefore, Tess has to drive his cart to the market because he is too drunk. By fate, while Tess was on the way to the market, the mail carriage runs into her cart and kills her family's only horse. Because of this incident, Tess feels responsible for her family's loss and goes to their newly discovered relations, the Durbervilles, to seek financial assistance. Here, by fate, Tess meets Alec Durbervilles, who, unknown to Tess, is really a stoke who bought the use of the ancient name Durbervilles. By fate, after a quarrel one night with drunken townswoman, Tess accepts Alec's offer of a ride home when he conveniently shows up. And by a miserable fate, Alec takes advantage of Tess. These are only a few illustrations from the beginning of Hardy's Tess showing the enormous role that fate plays. Another note of Hardy's artistry that is present in Tess is in how he arranges the scenery and the season in concurrence with the events taking place in the novel. It was said about Hardy's work that place and season had been to some extent fitted into accord with the action of the story. In Tess, this adjustment is managed with the highest art. For example, in the beginning of Tess we see her dancing in the May dance. She is cheerful and happy, so far untouched by the downward spiral that fate has in store. The season and Tess's feelings were in unison, as it says that cheerfulness and May were synonyms. Tess goes to the so-called Durbervilles in the middle of the summer, when things are still looking bright and she returns home in the middle of the autumn decay after the tragedy of what happened with her and Alec in the gloomy woodlands. It is summer again when Tess is at Talbothay's dairy farm, and this is the time of bright and sensuous courtship between Angel Claire and Tess. It is winter when Tess and Angel marry, and they spend their wedding night in the dark ancestral manor house of the Durbervilles. Both the season and the house that they stay in are used to illustrate and foreshadow the gloomy events that transpire on their wedding night and the years following. It is the dreary winter again when Tess is left as a deserted wife working to support herself at the harsh and unsympathetic Flintcomb Ash Farm. After Tess murders Alec, she flees with Angel Clare and they spend one last bittersweet night together at Stonehenge, the ruins of the pagan temple where sacrifices used to take place on the altars. This is symbolic of the sacrifice that Tess has made in her life, but how in the end she is still the one that is, by fate, being sacrificed. While lying on the stones, she says, this happiness could not have lasted. These illustrations show how Hardy uses the seasons and the settings parallel to the events in the story to add greater depth and meaning. After the controversy surrounding Tess and Jude, Hardy tried his hand at writing plays. 
Some of his plays include The Dynast, written in 1904, The Well Beloved, 1912, Human Shows, 1925, Winter Words, 1928. He also wrote poetry and published them in collections such as Wessex, Poems and Other Verse in 1898, Poems, 1912 through 1913, Moments of Vision, 1917, Late Lyrics and Earlier, 1922. Hardy's poetry neither sets nor follows a period style, nor does it undergo any drastic changes of manner or theme from early to late. His occasional ruggedness of metrical accent and oddness of dictation are a deliberate technique employed by a master craftsman for the conveyance of sincere emotion and authentic drama. Some of his best verse is deeply personal, even confessional. It is about loving and losing, about mistakings and perplexities lived through once, then hauntingly recalled. About the sadness and strangeness about living so many of his contemporaries about the sober joy he took in registering the world of Wessex in all its weathers and moods, and in all the variety of its human and natural occupants. His mastery, both as an author and a poet, lies in the creation of natural surroundings, making discoveries through close observation and acute sensitiveness. He notices the smallest and most delicate details, yet he can also paint vast landscapes of his own Wessex in melancholy or noble moods. An example of his mastery is present in the poem titled, Snow in the Suburbs. Snow in the Suburbs. Every branch big with it, bent every twig with it. Every fork like a white web foot, every street and pavement mute. Some flakes have lost their way and grope back upward when, meeting those meandering down, they turn and descend again. The palings are glued together like a wall. There is no waft of wind with the fleecy fall. A sparrow enters the tree, whereupon immediately a snow lump, thrice his own slight size, descends on him and showers his head and eyes, and overturns him and near interns him, and lights on a neither twig when its brush starts off a volley of other lodging lumps with a rush. The steps are a blanket slope, up which, with feeble hope, a black cat comes, wide-eyed and thin, and we take him in. Again we see Hardy's descriptive sensitivity to his surroundings in the poem titled The Voice. The Voice was dedicated to his wife Emma, whose passing away left him grief-stricken. For is it only the breeze in its listlessness, traveling across the wet mead to me here? You being ever dissolved to wan wistlessness, heard no more again, far or near. This eye faltering forward leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin to the thorn from nowhere, and the woman calling. In 1914, Thomas married his old friend and secretary, Florence Emily Dugdale, who lived from 1879 through 1937. She would later publish The Early Life of Thomas Harding, and the later years of Thomas Hardy. Hardy died January 11, 1928, at the age of 85. His heart was buried in Stinford Church. And his ashes in Poets Corner, Westminster Abbey. During Hardy's lifetime, he achieved some noteworthy things. One, he was president of the Society of British Authors. Two, he was bestowed the Order of Merit in 1910. And three, in 1912, he received the Gold Medal of the Royal Society of Literature, a rare honor. And four, an honorary degree from Cambridge University. Thomas Hardy said that, my opinion is that a poet should express the emotion of all the ages and the thoughts of his own. And he did, in fact, achieve this aspiration. Thank you for watching my author project on Thomas Hardy. Have a wonderful day and God bless.